Okay, in this tutorial I'm going to run you through the parts of the eye. Now the eye is one of our major um, or most important sensory organs. Um, a lot of information um, gets sent from our eye to the brain um, and, and a decent part of our brain is actually devoted to processing that, that, that information. Um, so the eye is one of our major sensory organs. Um, we're going to have a look at the parts of the eye. Um, you guys have probably done an eye dissection, so you may have seen some of these parts in a, in a real eye. Um, but we're going to quickly go through what each part does and, and what each part is called. So, looking at here, um, at the, starting at the very front of the eye, if you were to lift up one of your eyelids and, and actually touch your eye, and I don't recommend doing that because you don't want to kind of bring bacteria into, uh, into your eye, um, but if you were to lift up your eyelid and, and actually touch the very surface of the eye, you'd be touching a part of the eye called the cornea. Um, the cornea is a very uh, a tough layer. Uh, the front of the eye is a lot tougher than people often think. And if you do an eye dissection, if you, if you try to cut through that or, or try to sort of tear it with your fingers, it's actually quite a tough material and it's, it's probably a little bit thicker than, than people often think. Um, the cornea plays um, an, a really important role in, in protecting the eye, um, but it also actually um, uh, plays a plays a role in focusing the, the, the light into the eye. So it's not just um, the lens, we'll look at that next, well, we'll look at that in a minute, um, but it's not just the lens inside the eye. Uh, the cornea is involved in sort of starting to bend or focus the, the light into the eye as well. So cornea obviously has to be a clear layer. Um, it's the front surface of the eye, um, essentially where light passes through it and into our eyes. Just behind the cornea, is what we call the aqueous humor. Um, and the aqueous humor is just a fluid. So it's not, not really um, an object or, or a solid thing. It's not uh, so much of a tissue as it is simply um, a fluid that fills the, the, the very front space um, of the eye just behind the cornea. So the aqueous humor is quite a watery fluid um, and basically helps to lubricate things, helps them sort of be able to slide over each other um, and just also maintains the pressure. Like you couldn't really have the eye filled with with air. It keeps the eye sort of, you know, um, under a slight pressure to keep it nice and round um, and tight. So the aqueous humor um, in there, um, basically just behind the cornea, just a fluid, a watery fluid that helps to lubricate the lens and, and other parts like the ciliary body. Things we'll look at in a minute. All right. So going a little bit deeper into the eye, uh, the lens. The lens. This part here. This shown sort of in white, is a clear part, another clear part of the eye. Um, and the lens here, its real job is to basically focus the light rays onto the back of the eye. The back of the eye is called the retina, and that's where the light signals it. The light actually gets picked up and messages get sent to the brain. So the, the, the lens essentially focuses light on the back of the eye. Um, now the lens can actually shape, change shape slightly. It's a flexible structure, and if you do it a section, and if you manage to get the lens out in one piece, um, it feels like a really thick jelly, almost like the jelly inside a jelly bean. It's quite dense, quite a dense kind of thick jelly. But you can actually essentially, essentially smush it in your, in your fingers. You can actually squash it. Um, it. It's essentially more like a dense jelly. Um, the lens, though, is slightly flexible. And if you manage to get it out in one piece, you can put it on a piece of newspaper and it will actually magnify the letters on the newspaper. Um, and if you squeeze it, if you change its shape slightly, you'll notice that it that it uh, magnifies those letters uh, uh, e even slightly more. Um, so the lens has to be able to change shape so that we can focus on objects that are close up and far away. Um, and so if I go down a little bit here, the ciliary body um, are these little bits here, um, essentially where that attach onto the lens and hold it in place. But their role is also um, they're tiny little muscles that can essentially stretch and change the, the shape of the lens um, to help us focus on things that are up close or further away. So if you look at the lens here, a ciliary body at the top and at the bottom, um, in a diagram and a test, they're always the bits that are essentially attached onto the lens or holding the lens in, in its position. They can change the shape of the lens um, and in order to help us focus on things that are up close or further away. When we get older, these muscles get a bit weaker, um, or, or possibly the lens gets a bit stiffer, um, but essentially we become less able to change, to alter the shape of the lens, um, and that's why often uh, many of us, when we get a bit older, need um, bifocal glasses, we need 
glasses that help us to to focus on things that are far away and up close because we're no longer able to to kind of change the shape of that lens as, as effectively so um, changing altering key things to remember there just altering the shape of that lens is what helps us focus on things that are that are far away or things that are up close so squashing it together um, or, or stretching it um, is what allows us to, to focus on things all right, ciliary, ciliary body, those or sometimes called the ciliary muscles are the things that, that actually do that. Okay, so up the top here, the vitreous humor. Well, what's the difference between the vitreous and the aqueous humor? Well, essentially, there are two chambers to the eye. There's a little pocket of fluid in the front here on this side of the lens, um, and then there's a, a fluid that fills the, the inner part of the eye, the back end of, of the eye in here. And uh, this was the, the aqueous humor, the watery stuff, um, that essentially lubricates the, the lens um, and the iris, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, and then there's the, the vitreous humor. Um, the vitreous humor fills the, the main part of the eye. And again, it's a clear fluid. This is often a, a much thicker, um, sort of jelly-like fluid. Um, and if you do a dissection, if you take it out, it really does feel like jelly. Um, and it basically fills the, the larger cavity, the, the main part of the eye. We've got some eye muscles that attach to the top of the eye, and they essentially just help to uh, rotate, to, to basically move the eye so we can look at things without just turning our head. Um, from there, guys, out the back, you see the optic nerve. Now, we'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, so in here, the retina. This is probably one of the most important parts of the eye. The retina is a layer that coats the back of the eye, the very back of the eye. So the retina um, has cells in it that essentially pick up light, and um, they, they take that and they convert that signal into an electrical signal, which gets sent out the back of the eye here, through the optic nerve, and to the brain. So the retina contains the sensor, the sensory cells, that essentially absorb light and turn that into an electrical signal, so we can send it to our brain where where you know we actually end up seeing things. Without sending that signal to the brain, we wouldn't be able to see things. Um, so the retina um, has, has an area called the, the fovea centralis. That's where you've got kind of the highest density of those sen sensory cells. And that's what kind of picks up our central field of vision. And that's why actually the center part of our vision, our central vision, is the most detailed, whereas our peripheral vision um, isn't maybe quite as detailed. So in the retina, um, we've got things that are called cone cells, um, and we've also got rod cells. Um, so the cone cells um, are really concentrated at that central point. And so the cone cells are what pick up light, and in, in, uh, they, they operate best under, under high light intensity or um, during the daytime. Um, and they also contain different colored pigments that absorb diff the different colors. So this means the cone cells are capable of detecting differences in color um, of the light. So it's the cone cells in our central vision that actually help us to see things in color. Um, and that, that gives us the area, so our central vision is also the area of sharpest vision. So in the, in the central part of the, the back on the retina here, um, there's, a, there's a large density of these cone cells which gives us very sharp color vision when there's a lot of light around. Getting more towards the, the edge of the retina, sort of the top and the bottom of, of this diagram, sort of more towards the edges here, we'll find that there are more rod cells. Um, so rod cells are also located in the retina, that, that layer in the back, but rod cells only contain sort of one, one pigment. So they can't tell the difference between um, colors. All, all the rod cells have the same colored pigment in them. They, they can't differentiate between um, the different colors of, of light that are coming in. Um, so that means the rod cells essentially give us black and white vision. Now you might think that's a bit strange. Um, you're probably used to seeing things in color. Well, actually at night time, uh, these rod cells, the reason we still have them is that they operate really well um, in conditions where light levels are really, really low. So your night vision at night time when you're trying to see, you're largely, you know, your vision is largely based on these rod cells. Um, and at night, your vision does does kind of lose a lot of its color. Like it, it, you don't see colors as vividly um, when there's less light around. So it's not things that you know things actually appear less colorful when there's less light around. 
um, because we've, we're relying more on these rod cells which can't actually differentiate between colours. It also, interestingly, at our peripheral, our peripheral vision, at the edges of our vision, um, is, is picked up by these rod cells um, because the cone cells aren't found right at the edges of the retina. Um, and so that means our peripheral vision is essentially black and white. Now, your brain kind of fills in your, your field of vision based on what it's seen previously, and it, you're looking around the room, and it'll, you know, you'll kind of essentially remember that something was a certain color, and so your brain will, will associate that color with it. But your central vision is actually, your central vision is actually essentially black and white. Um, and you can test that, get, someone, get, get some colored objects, and get someone to, to bring them into your field of vision from behind you. So someone gets on to stand behind you and slowly bring it just e either side, like on one side of your head, past your ear, and when it just pops into your field of view, when you can just see it in your periphery, without looking at it, keep looking straight ahead, without looking at it, try to say what color it is, and you'll find it's actually very difficult, or you'll often get it wrong. You'll think it's one color, but it's totally not. It's, it's a totally different color. Works best if you've got several objects that are the same shape, um, but just different colors. So if you've got three colored pens that are that are each different color, like three felt tip pens or something that are that are different colors, get someone to to sort of bring them into your field of vision from behind. Um, and when they're just sitting in your peripheral vision, if you don't look at them, if you just keep them in your peripheral vision, it's very difficult to tell what color they are because you're you're really seeing them with those rod cells. Um, you don't have those cone cells in at the periphery of at the edges of your retina um, to to tell you what color they are. Okay, onwards. All right, so uh, optic nerve carries those signals out the back. So there'll be a small spot, a blind spot at the back of your eye, where the uh, where the retina essentially attaches to the optic nerve. And again, it just means at that point where all the cables, where all the neurons are running out the back, um, as the optic nerve, you can't have any of the the, the cone cells. So there is actually a little spot in our vision. Um, called our blind spot where we don't see anything, but our brain fills that gap in with what we've seen previously or by scanning, by looking around, or what we see with the other eye, and so we don't see a blind spot. We don't see a random kind of black spot in our vision, and that's because we've got two eyes, because we're moving around, we're looking. Our brain will fill in that spot, essentially, based on what it's seen with the other eye and based on what it's seen previously um, or what it thinks should be there um, from its kind of experience, from what it's seen previously. So we don't see a random black spot, but there is actually a small spot in, in, in our field of view for each eye where we're actually filling in the gaps. We're not at, you can't actually be guaranteed what's there. Okay, all right, moving on. Um, so down this end of the eye, um, the outer part of the eye, um, so the part that goes around the back, this is called the sclera, and it's essentially the white part of the eye. Um, now the sclera is actually what turns into at the front into a clear layer called the was the cornea. All right, um, so the sclera is just a tough layer around the back, and it turns into a clear layer at the front called the cornea. So the cornea is just a continuation of the sclera. The conjunctiva um, is basically a membrane that that covers the sclera, so a thin sort of slippery layer that covers the sclera, and I think that that basically also helps to lubricate or helps the eye to slide. In the in the eye socket, so a thin membrane, slippery membrane that covers um, the sclera. Um, just on the inside of the sclera, in between the retina and the sclera, is a layer of the choroid, um, and it, it basically has a rich blood supply. It's got small blood vessels in it that nourish the retina. So this is the layer that feeds the retina. Just ignore that. Uh, this is a layer that feeds the retina. Um, the retina, it's got all those those lovely um, cone and rod cells in it, um, those cells need to be fed too. So there's a blood supply in the choroid, this, this sort of layer in the middle um, that feeds the retina um, with, with um, oxygen and nutrients from, from the blood supply there. The optic nerve, just before we move on, should, should, should just uh, remind you guys there, a nerve is basically a bundle of neurons. So it's like a cable, a bundle of neurons um, all running side by side. This optic nerve is, is lots and lots of neurons. They're axons sitting side by side that, that send all those messages to the brain. Okay, uh, one last uh, important part of the eye um, is the iris. Um, now the iris is the colored part of the eye. Now if we just go up a little bit, um, you can see in, in this view of the eye, the iris, again, it's the colored part. In this, in this case, we've got a, um, a brown colored eye. 
Um, the iris here sits in between the cornea and the and uh, the the lens, um, so surrounded by the aqueous humor, that that fluid filling the front cavity, the front part of the eye. Um, if we come back down here, the iris is essentially what controls how much light comes into the eye. So the pupil is the the black part in the center of the eye, and it's essentially just a hole. The pupil is a hole in the iris. And so that's a round opening, and again, the, the iris or the pupil regulates how much light goes into the eye. Now the iris has two really important muscles in it, the dilator muscle and the sphincter muscle. The dilator muscle basically uh, uh, widens the pupil, makes the hole larger, um, and the sphincter muscle, when it contracts, makes the pupil smaller, so lets in less light. Now that's really important um, because it controls how much light enters the eye. Um, and why is that so important? Well, essentially, when, when conditions are really bright, um, the sphincter muscle uh, must close up the iris and make the pupil smaller to let in less light because too much light getting to, into the eye would damage the retina. And that's one of the reasons, you know, people say don't stare into the sun and things like that. Essentially, too much light into the eye can damage the retina, damage those cone and rod cells um, that, that pick up light. Um, and that could could damage and, and potentially even irreversibly damage um, our vision. So the sphincter muscle controls, so closes up to let less light in. So why why do we need the dilator muscle then to open it up? Well, we still want to be able to see when there's not so much light around. So um, in the evenings or at night when there's just a little bit of starlight, when, starlight or moonlight, um, we need some light to be able to see if it's completely black. If there's no light, we won't we won't be able to see anything. But in low light conditions, um, we, we still want to try and be able to see as much as possible so we can get through. Um, the dilator muscle opens up the, the iris, so widens the pupil so that more light can come in to help us see in low light conditions. So those two muscles, they're just acting to control how much light comes into the eye um, in order to, you know, to close it. If too much is getting in there, then it might damage the eye. Um, and to open it up um, to um, let in more light when it's low light conditions, when it's difficult to see. And that's actually, if you buy a laser pointer, um, laser pointers, um, if you shine them in someone's eye, you can actually damage the retina. And there's a limit um, on, on the power of the, the laser pointers you get um, that you're actually allowed to buy. Um, and they've set that limit such that if someone shines a laser pointer in your eye, the iris um, or the person will react, can react fast enough before any permanent damage is caused. So they'll blink and close the eye, the iris will close up, they'll turn their head away to prevent any damage. Um, but higher powered lasers, if you shine them in their eye, that response might not be quick enough, the damage might already be done. So those are the ones you can't just buy um, from the store. Anyway, interesting little fact there, but uh, guys, iris just controls how much light goes in and out. So for your assessment, unfortunately, you do got to know, you've got to know all the parts of the eye. Um, and in this test, the, your upcoming test, guys, um, attention to detail is going to be important. So um, learn all the parts um, and try and make sure you know all your terms um, and the details for that test. Okay, well, well, let's move on to the next one.